Good morning. I'm so glad you're here with us today. Today we're continuing the series that we launched last week. As you recall, in this series, we're looking at a couple of things. One thing we want to look at is how we can identify these kind of dark negative feelings that we develop sometimes that kind of manifest as shame and guilt in our lives. And then once we understand those feelings, we want to look at what we can do to let go of those feelings and ultimately become free of them. So this week in part two of our series, Letting Go of Shame and Guilt, we want to focus on one simple truth, that you are already enough. Because these kind of feelings often cause us to work too hard and, and just try to prove that we're okay. And so we end up kind of burdening ourselves and, and wearing ourselves down because we don't feel okay. So we keep trying to prove that we're okay. We're trying to prove to ourselves that that dark voice that we hear in our head sometimes that often says really horrible things to us, we're trying to prove to ourselves that that voice is not telling the truth. But sometimes it's really hard to feel that way. So to get us started, I wanted to quickly look again at those definitions we looked at last week. Remember, first, we looked at the definition of shame. And Merriam-Webster tells us that shame is a painful emotion caused by consciousness of guilt, shortcoming, or impropriety. And then guilt is feelings of deserving blame, especially for imagined offenses or from a sense of inadequacy. So if we look at those two definitions, two phrases stand out. Shortcomings and sense of inadequacy. And in both those cases, what we're really kind of describing is this feeling that we're not enough. And when we feel like we're not enough, what we're going to start to do is start to try to do things to prove to ourselves that that idea is not true, that we'll actually start pushing ourselves to try to get past this idea that we're not enough. And one of the things that I've found is that when we're experiencing those kinds of feelings, it often causes us to do the exact opposite of what we need to do. Because when we feel this way, what we really need to do is take care of ourselves. We may, we may need to pull away from the busyness of life for a little bit. We, we may need to get with some friends or family that we trust. If things are getting really serious, it may be important to seek support from a professional. Those are the things that we need to do. We need to be taking care of ourselves. But often we do the exact opposite. And so what we often do when we're feeling these dark emotions, we start trying to earn our way out of those feelings. So we start trying to be really busy. And one way this kind of manifests is that we start just kind of volunteering for everything, is that no matter what someone asks us, we start volunteering for it. Not even necessarily knowing what we're getting into, but we will volunteer for it. And before we know it, we're volunteering for too many things. But it's not limited to volunteering. It could also be work, right? Just working too many hours, taking on too many projects. And what we end up doing in this case is we end up chasing a lie. Because we're trying to convince ourselves that if I do enough, that must mean I'm, I'm good enough. Or if I work hard enough, then that must mean that I'm also enough. But what we do know is that this process doesn't actually work. In fact, this kind of process, trying to earn our way into feeling like we're enough, actually makes things worse. It can actually drive us much deeper into those feelings. It can actually drive us much deeper into the darkness of that pain that goes with these emotions. And there's a particular challenge to overcoming this behavior. Because as we start to kind of volunteer for more and more things or take on more and more projects, we're going to start to get lots of reinforcement to continue doing that. Because if you volunteer for everything you're asked to do, what's going to happen? They're going to keep asking you to do stuff. And, and now you feel like, well, I must be doing a good job. They, they keep asking me. Or you start to hear phrases like, oh my goodness, we just couldn't do this if you weren't here. Or gosh, you know, you just always do such a fantastic job. And what ends up happening is that this is starting to wear you down. 
But as it's wearing you down, you just keep pushing on because you kind of start to feed off that external validation. And again, it's not limited to volunteering. I think it's a very common place, but it's not limited to volunteering. Again, it could be at your work. It could be that you're the person that everyone in your family always calls for help, no matter how inconvenient or difficult it is for you. It could be a neighbor. It could be whatever. And the thing is, is that this process at first starts to make us feel really popular because everybody needs us so much and people are always asking us. And again, we're receiving all these compliments. And those compliments often initially can help mask those really negative feelings that build up inside of us. But it doesn't last forever because before too long, we find ourselves overcommitted, exhausted, worn out. But in spite of that, we're still afraid to say no. Because now everybody needs us, right? They, they need us. I, I can't say no now. I mean, if I don't do it, who's going to do it? And people will tell us how much they count on us. And, and those are good things when done in balance. But it's very easy for those things to get out of balance. And what ends up happening then is those negative feelings that we had about ourselves when we started will actually start to get worse over time because the external compliments are not enough anymore. Or we may feel okay for a bit, but then we start waking up at 3 in the morning with all these horrible thoughts in our heads about ourselves. So what we know is that if we try to handle dark feelings like shame and guilt in this way by trying to work ourselves out of it, it actually starts a toxic cycle. Because the very thing that we do to try to make ourselves feel better you know, saying yes to all those different things, taking on too much responsibilities. Those things we did to make ourselves feel better now become just another factor that make us feel bad about ourselves. The very thing that we're doing to try and find peace in our lives is actually robbing us of our peace. And it's actually reinforcing this feeling that we're not enough. And that it's just reinforcing this idea as, as I can't keep up. And as these things feel so hard for me now, it shows I'm really not enough. And I just feel worse and bad. But it turns out things don't have to be this way. There is another way to feel like we're enough. And it's not about trying to work ourselves there. And we actually have an example of some different ways we can go about this from the author Luke. The author Luke from the New Testament actually documents for us the story of two sisters. And each of these sisters is actually going through a process of finding that they're enough, or at least trying to find that they're enough. Now Luke tells us that on a particular day, Jesus has been traveling, and after traveling, actually arrives at the home of some friends. He arrives at the home of a woman named Martha, who's there with her sister, Mary. And by all indications, Jesus, along with Mary and Martha, know each other very well. We actually see Mary and Martha in various points in the New Testament. So they're, they're all probably pretty close friends. And one of the things that would happen, as Jesus got more well-known, whenever he traveled and people knew where he was, people would come to hear him teach. So as Jesus arrives at Martha's home, there's a crowd. So he does what he does. He starts teaching. Now imagine this, that if, if you're Martha, and Martha believes that Jesus is who he says he is. So Jesus is in her home teaching right now. I mean, what an amazing opportunity, excuse me, an amazing opportunity. The embodiment of God is here with her right now, teaching in her home. So where's Martha? Oh, Martha's busy back in the kitchen. And she's not just busy in the kitchen, she's making this huge, involved dinner. I mean, think about this. Look at what she's missing. I mean, the incredible teaching happening just outside her door. And she's chosen to be in the other room, creating this huge meal. But now her sister Mary is with Jesus. And Mary is taking all this in. 
And it seems that Martha is not too happy about all this. Because Luke tells us that Mary is out listening to Jesus, but Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. Now, looking at this situation, do we really think that Martha would rather be out cooking this huge involved meal rather than being with Jesus? Do we think that Jesus has asked her to make this huge complex meal? That seems pretty unlikely. Now, it is important to understand that culturally at that time, if someone visited your home, you, it was customary to feed them. But Mary could feed him without creating this huge meal. It, we know that Jesus was not into big, complex meals. He wasn't into banquets. Something simple just placed for him to eat would have been plenty. And I'm pretty sure he would have rather had Martha there with him than off busy in the kitchen. What that tells us is that this big, complex meal is Martha's idea. But we know it's not really what she seems to want. It seems. So, so why is she doing it? Why is Martha doing this? Why is she doing the opposite of what she would actually most enjoy doing? Well, I think it's safe to say that Martha is actually seeking approval. Martha is seeking to feel like she's enough. But it's even kind of more than that. She also wants Jesus to point out that Mary's, what Mary's doing is wrong, that Mary is failing in some way, and that Martha is actually much better. And we know that this is not the only time we see this kind of behavior from Martha. Martha actually seemed to have a bit of a habit of telling Mary what Mary should be doing. In fact, I would bet that Martha had a habit of telling everybody what they should be doing. And I think that we can safely infer what's going on in Martha's mind. Basically, Martha's thinking that, you know what? I'll point out how much harder I'm working than Mary is. And then Jesus is going to tell me how good I am. And that will prove that I'm a good person. Those compliments will help me believe that I'm enough. And the thing that, as I look at this scenario, and I think about Jesus out there teaching while she's in here working so hard in the kitchen to believe that she's enough, as Jesus was teaching, there were common themes that he taught. He taught about God's love. He taught about acceptance. And there was a high probability he may have even been talking about, you are, excuse me, you are already enough. It's possible he was actually addressing exactly what she most needed. But she was so busy in the kitchen that she was missing it. And of course, Martha would have told herself, you know, I know I'm sure he's teaching something really important out there. But I'm willing to miss out on that. Because I work harder than anyone. And I take on more responsibility. And because I do all those things, Jesus is going to come in here and tell me how good I am. How good I am. And he'll tell Mary how bad she is. I can imagine that Martha had this whole exchange planned out in her mind. She thought that just saying what she said to Jesus was going to lead to all these things happening afterwards. But as is so often the case... When people engage Jesus, expecting Jesus to do what they want him to do, his reply is very different than what's expected. We're told, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. Now let's look at Jesus' words. Martha is distracted. So he doesn't say that, Martha, you're so busy doing these many things, and gosh, you're accomplishing so much. That's not what he says. He says, you're distracted by all these things. If she's distracted, it means she's not paying attention to what's important. Jesus is telling Martha very directly, Martha, you're focused on the wrong things. And I think this word distracted is something we have to consider in our own lives as well. 
Because I think it captures what a lot of us are trying to achieve when we make ourselves so busy. We're trying to distract ourselves from our feelings. We're trying to work so much that we don't have to pay attention to our feelings. And we're trying to work so much that if we work enough, it will prove that we are enough. If we work enough, we believe we can prove to ourselves that now I'm good enough. So if Martha's busyness was a distraction from what was important, what should she have been focused on? Well, Jesus tells us. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. So Jesus says that Mary has discovered what's important. What did she, what did she discover? Well, she discovered that she was already enough. She discovered that she could stop striving to be enough. Instead, she could accept God's love. And she could recognize that her faith in Jesus and receiving God's love for her already made her enough. This wasn't about earning enough. But now, this leads to an obvious question. If the right thing for Mary to do was to not strive, to not work so hard, but to receive this teaching from Jesus and receive the message and lesson from it, I think it leads us to a really, really obvious question. What Mary is doing is the right thing, then it means that we should all be like Mary. But if we all become a bunch of Marys, who's going to fix dinner? And actually, the answer to that is actually more obvious than it might seem at first. If we're all receiving what Jesus is trying to get us to see, that we are already enough, if we are all receiving what's meant for us, the person who fixes dinner will be the person who is supposed to fix dinner. And that person will not create a huge, complex meal just to create it. That person will do it in the right proportion. The thing that's so important for us to understand is that as we go through our lives and as we deal with difficult emotions, we often become very quick to do things, to take action. Often doing so, not even being sure what we actually should do. We often think that, well, you know, as long as I do enough, then we'll be enough. And this idea that if I do enough, then I'll be enough, that idea is actually backwards. What Jesus wants us to see is that we are already enough. You are already enough. And then by accepting that truth that you are already enough, you then can do the things that you should do. And stop taking on so much. The Apostle Paul puts it this way. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. In other words, what Paul is telling us is that our faith makes us enough. We can stop striving to be enough. And that God has a plan for each of our lives. Don't get so busy that you miss out on the plan for your life. Because the thing we need to understand is that the plan is different for each of us. But if the plan is different for each of us, how do we learn what the plan for each of us is? The way we learn it is to be like Mary. Embrace this truth that you are already enough. Stop trying to earn it. And then once you understand that, we can recognize that there are different times in our lives. There are times to listen and grow and be fed. And then there are other times to do and take action. So what we need to do is be still. Be patient. Embrace your relationship with God. Embrace your relationship with one, excuse me, with one another. And then trust God 
to lead you. You know, I find it interesting that in the light of this account that we just looked at with Mary and Martha, people often characterize Mary as lazy. Like nothing could be farther from the truth. As I mentioned, we see Mary and Martha in various places throughout the New Testament. And later, Mary will do something that is incredibly difficult. She will do something that is an incredibly important part of Jesus' journey to the cross. She does something that very few people could do. And it's only possible because Mary was prepared. She was prepared by her deep faith in Jesus. She was prepared by her understanding that she is already enough. And then she was prepared because she had a willingness to listen to God's guiding and wait until it was time for her to take action. And then she takes the action that she should. And as I said, friends, we need to be prepared. And a key part of being prepared is supporting one another. Again, that's why throughout this series, we're running a short four-week life group. Each week in the life group corresponds to the message from the previous Sunday. Again, the meetings are on Zoom, so they're safe from a pandemic standpoint. Being on Zoom, it doesn't matter where you are, you can participate. And if you're watching this video, you are invited to join us at these meetings. Now, to make the meetings accessible, we offer them at two different times during the week. There's a morning meeting and an evening meeting. The evening meeting is on Sundays between 6 p.m. and 7 p.m. The morning meeting is on Tuesdays between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. All the information for the meetings is out on our website, ucwarner.org. You'll find the link for Zoom out there on the website. You'll also find with each week's message some discussion questions. The questions are just there to help the conversation get started. And as people come together, everyone can talk about what they're feeling relative to these topics. Because again, we need to be prepared and we need to support one another and we need to grow so we can do what we've been called to do. We've got to really be careful of not just jumping into action. If we jump at every single opportunity that goes by, it will exhaust us. Because friends, what we do not want to do is be so busy chasing every single opportunity that we miss the opportunities that are meant for us. Because, my friends, you have a unique purpose. You hear me say this often, and I absolutely, excuse me, absolutely believe it. That you are uniquely qualified to do what no one else will do. But if we're so busy, we will miss those opportunities. So, friends, recognize that the way to get free of these dark emotions, the road to peace and serenity, is not found, is not traveled by working harder. What we need to do is receive and accept this truth that you are already enough. We need to rest in Jesus and listen to God's guiding. Embrace the support of your church family. Participate in this life group. And then when it's time and when we're prepared, step out and do what only you can do. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I am uh, grateful for this simple truth that sometimes is so hard for us to embrace. Lord, you have made us already enough. It's not about working for it. It's not about earning it. It's not about proving to anyone that we're enough. Lord, we accept the truth that you love us. We receive your love. We trust your guiding, Lord. Lord, we just pray for our own understanding to know when it's time to grow and listen and to know when it's time to act. And recognize we'll move back and forth through different times and different parts of our lives, sometimes even different times of day, just doing each of these things. But Lord, I pray that we will each embrace these gifts, embrace these ideas, and pray that we'll each embrace the peace that you offer, being free 
from the dark thoughts that can fill our heads so easily, Lord, recognizing that you love us completely and your love makes us enough. Lord, so I thank you for all we have. I thank you for our church family. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.